Hello and welcome everybody to the Lunchtime Discovery Series virtual presentation brought to you by the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education. Hey, you made it to the show. Glad that you could be here. Thanks for joining us. My name is Chris. I am curator for the SCCU Daily Planet Theater over at our fabulous Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. And every Wednesday at noon, we gather right here on the YouTube in order to bring you a great program. Now, normally when the museum is open, I partner with the Office of Environmental Education and we host the show inside the Daily Planet Theater. Uh, it's an opportunity for folks to grab some lunch and then come have a seat in the theater and hear from experts and insightful, experienced people about things that they know the most about. We learn about science and nature and education, all kinds of great topics every Wednesday. Of course, the museum is closed, so we figured out how to do it right here for you virtually. And that's what we're doing every Wednesday at noon, which is also to say you can subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel and then click the bell to be notified. And then when the museum goes live here on YouTube with any of our great programming, including this one, you'll get a little ping and then you can click over and join us every single week. Uh, we put on a great show and we hear from amazing people every single time. Today is no different. Although uh, for today's program, we haven't gone too far afield from the museum in order to find today's guest. Bonnie Emick is the head of Prairie Ridge Eco Station. Prairie Ridge being the museum's sort of, what do we call it, Bonnie? The backyard of the museum in West mm -hmm. Raleigh. Yes, indeed. Thanks for being here, Bonnie. Glad you could join us. Oh, thanks for having me. So, uh, Bonnie, how are things? I know you've been very busy uh, with work doing virtual programs and even some like really cool stuff over at, at Prairie Ridge recently. Yeah, absolutely. We've been uh, we've been closed as long as the museum's been closed, but we've been very busy um, still tending uh, to our land and doing some virtual programs. So, yeah, we're keeping busy. Bonnie, I'll let you take it away and teach us all a little bit about what's going on at Prairie Ridge. Sounds good. Um, so as Chris said, my name is Bonnie Emick. I'm the head of Prairie Ridge Eco Station. And um, my role there is I am the site director and the education coordinator for that site. Um, uh, and what I'm gonna talk about today is just a general overview about Prairie Ridge and who we are and what we do. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, so Prairie Ridge Eco Station, um, it is, let's see, my computer wants to lag, so that's really fun. There's my title screen, and it will not advance. Let me try something different. Yeah, we'll try it again, and I'll remind everybody uh, while we're getting this up and running, don't worry, we tested it first, everybody, but uh, as we go through the presentation, Leave your questions and comments in the chat box because we're going to be keeping an eye on that. And at the end of Bonnie's presentation, we'll grab your thoughts and share them with Bonnie and answer your questions. So let me know what you're thinking as we go through in the chat box. Go ahead, Bonnie. Hey, look, the slide advanced. Yay, technology. All right. So Prairie Ridge Eco Station is part of the Museum of Natural Sciences. And look, Chris, you're there. Look at that. Um, so we are part of the Museum of Natural Sciences, which the main campus is in downtown Raleigh. Hopefully most of you have been there or at least aware of it. Maybe you have on our to-do list for later. Um, but we are the museum's backyard. We are located in West Raleigh. Um, so over here um, by Shank Forest off of Edwards Mill Road, we're really near um, I-40 here where Wade continues out. Um, and so we're in this little nook here. We're kind of hidden in there. You've probably driven right past it and had no idea. Here's Edwards Mill, here's Reedy Creek, and over here is the Art Museum. So we're really not that far from downtown. Um, Prairie Ridge was open in 2004. It contains about 40 acres, um, which includes prairie forest, stream, pond, um, a lot of habitat. We do programs and events when we're open. Of course, we'll talk about what we're doing virtually currently while we've been closed. Um, and we have a lot of features such as a nature play space, an outdoor classroom, nature neighborhood garden, and of course, 
we do a lot of wildlife viewing out there. We also do a lot of education um, in a lot of different ways. This building here is our outdoor classroom. Um, it's basically a big screened in porch. Um, and this is where we hold some of our programs. Um, it is a green building. It is built with a lot of green features, including a cistern that feeds to our toilets. Um, and it's constructed in a way that takes advantage of uh, the wind and the sun direction. So um, it's always cooler in there than it is outside, which is really great because it's so hot <laughs> lately. Um, it's always cooler in there and we take advantage of the natural lighting. Um, so we do some programs out of there. You can do some bird watching off of that back deck. Um, and, uh, but we use the rest of the, the property as our classroom as well. When we're open, we have a lot of different types of programming from um, nature stories, which is a preschool program. We do stream studies, pond studies. We look at macroinvertebrates in our waterways. We have workshops for adults. We have field trips public programs, all sorts of stuff. We're usually closed at night, but every few, uh, a couple times a year, we'll do nighttime viewing, either for moths, um, fireflies, or even astronomy. We'll usually do a couple astronomy nights as well, partnered with the Raleigh Astronomy Club. So we do a wide variety of programs all over the property for all ages, um, normally. The nature play space at Prairie Ridge Eco Station is definitely our most popular place for general visitation. So this is not your normal playground. This is a natural area designed for imaginative play. We want kids to come in and build um, with sticks, make mud pies, play in the water, um, all that sort of stuff. So the things we have in this play space include a water table and a dig pit and some uh, loose parts, hands-on tools. So we'll have pots, pans, shovels, spoons, all that kind of stuff um, to really engage kids in imaginative play. Um, so lots and lots of mud pies happening down there, uh, digging uh, in the sand. I swear sometimes they're digging to China, um, fairy house building, all that sort of stuff. We also have programs down in that space too, primarily for, primarily for early childhood audiences, um, but it's fun for all ages. Our nature neighborhood garden is uh, fenced in so the deer don't eat all of our plants. Uh, everything in this garden is built, uh, planted for pollinators. Everything in this garden is native with the exception of one plant and that would be bronze fennel, but the caterpillars love it. So this garden is an example of how you can landscape with native plants um, that are beneficial for pollinators um, and also can make your yard look really pretty. So when it's in full bloom, there are just bees and wasps and butterflies everywhere. We are finally coming up um, on butterfly season. Um, I don't specifically know, but it seemed like everybody was seeing, seeing a lag in butterflies this year. And we are finally seeing uh, uptick in butterflies and caterpillars out there um, in the past couple weeks, which is really, really great. We've had bees and wasps out there um, so far this whole time. Um, we do have a plant list on our website and I'll have the link later. So if you're interested to know what kind of native plants we've put in this garden, if you're interested in putting in your own native pollinator garden in your yard, we do have that resource available on our website. So you can go to your garden shop and see if you can find some of these same species as well. We also have our Jesse P. Perry Arboretum. Jesse is retired from the museum and he initiated this arboretum. He, there are more than 50 species of trees and each tree has two to three individual trees so that they can cross pollinate. The idea is that we have all of the lowland species across North Carolina in this arboretum so that we can produce seeds here. Um, and it's also educational. So every arboretum tree has a tag um, like this one you see in the bottom corner, the silver tag here. Every arboretum tree has a tag just like that. So you can see here, this is the common name um, bladdernut, which I actually didn't have pictured here, bladdernut, and then there's the scientific name as well. So if you are learning your trees, whether or not you want to learn the whole scientific name or not, this is also a great place to come and learn those trees, look at their leaves, their fruits, their barks, all of that, and really get to know these trees. 
We have multiple aquatic habitats on site. Um, we have our big pond there that is man-made. Um, we currently have no fish in it because everything that lives in this pond, the, all the animals have gotten there on their own, either by walking, flying, hopping. So fish don't really do any of those. So we don't have any fish in this pond. So we have a very high biodiversity of macroinvertebrates in this pond, which is really fun to study. We usually study this with thousands of school kids every year who come and um, look through the pond water and we determine what's in that pond. We also have a stream um, where we can also look, we bring some of the older kids down there to look at macroinvertebrates. And in both places, we often talk about human impacts on our waterways based on what the students are seeing in these areas. And of course, we're called Prairie Ridge, so we have a prairie. Most of our land is actually prairie. Um, and to maintain a prairie, you actually have to disturb it. You can't just plant a prairie and leave it alone. It requires a lot of maintenance. Um, throughout the year. If we didn't do anything to it, it succession would happen and it would turn into woods and forest, which is great. It's still native lands, but we are managing it for prairie because it, it adds a whole new ecosystem, a whole different ecosystem to support biodiversity. And one way we do that is by burning it. So we actually have one of our staff is actually our burn boss, Brian Hahn, that's him right there. He works with the North Carolina Forest Service and other agencies to make sure that we pick the right day, time, weather to really get in there and do it safely. So what we're doing is normally about one third of our prairie property we're burning every year, usually. And a third we're mowing, which replicates grazing. And a third we leave fallow. That way we still have that seed bed and that shelter for those animals that are still living in our prairie. We try and do this in the winter so we have the least impact on wildlife, um, but it all depends on the weather. We are in the middle of Raleigh, uh, right by 40, and so there are a lot of parameters that Brian's got to look at to make sure that we don't smoke out any of the roadways and that we do it as safely as possible to keep it controlled. There's lots of other factors that go into that, but this prairie burn is really low um, because it's mostly burning up grasses, so it, it's actually a pretty quick burn through, um, which is really, really cool to see. Um, and the reason why this works in a prairie is prairie grasses have really long root systems. And I should say grasses, flowers, other plants that you'd see in a prairie. They have really long roots. So as the fire goes through, it's burning off all the tops, all the leaves, all the flowers that happen to be remaining. But the root system is very strong. So they're able to spring right back up. And once everything above them is burned, for example, if there's blackberry or tree or anything, it kind of knocks it back. So these plants have more access to the sun. Um, so they spring right back up. Um, it's actually really cool to see them all spring right back up. And by comparison, way over here on the left, this is your typical lawn grass. You can see that these have really short roots here. Um, I mean, your lawn probably, you know, bounce right back, but these prairie grasses, they are used to frequent fires, for example, lightning strikes. Um, so they bounce right back. So on the right here, you can see this is a photo after our burn in 2008. Um, I'm sorry, it's 2000, 2018, wow. So this, you can see it's, it's pretty scorched. I should have put in another photo of a couple months later, everything coming right back. Um, and it, it really does bounce right back. When we do our prairie burns, we usually are open to the public. Um, and so we find a safe way, we block off different areas, but we invite the public to come watch the burn and learn about it. Um, so this is also 2018. These are some kids safely watching from the other side of the pond. This burn happened in February, so that you can see it's winter. Um, and so they really enjoyed it. What was really cool is members of the North Carolina um, Forest Service also, once everything was safe, they actually took the time to come over and show the equipment to the kids, which they loved. It was really great. All of these things, the pond, the stream, the prairie, the arboretum, these all make multiple unique habitats for a wide biodiversity of animals. So we have a high bio biodiversity of a wide range of animals, which also makes it really fun to work at Prairie Ridge because this I get to see this stuff just about every day. Um, from the prairie, uh, we have a ton of rabbits out there, uh, the nature neighborhood garden, lots of pollinators in the woods. We have all these large mammals that 
uh, you would imagine that would be in the woods. And because of that, because we're also part of the Museum of Natural Sciences, we do a lot of research, real research. Of course, hopefully you know that the Museum of Natural Sciences is a research museum. We are you know, normally open to the public, with lots of really fun, amazing exhibits and programs, but we also have some amazing researchers that work alongside us on our staff. And some of those research at, researchers actually do research on Prairie Ridge property, which is really, really cool to be a little part of. Um, so, we have our ornithologists come out about every other week and bird band. So they catch the birds safely and they put this little silver band on them that has a special code on it. So that if this bird is caught again, um, they'll be able to match the records. So they're taking records such as how old the bird is. They're taking all kinds of measurements and weights um, and keeping track of that. And if that bird is caught again, they can tell how far it traveled, if it's gained or lost weight, if it's been injured, all sorts of really cool stuff. We also usually have a hummingbird researcher come in outside of the museum and do similar work on tiny, tiny hummingbirds, which is really fascinating. Um, we have herpetologists who are studying the frogs and the turtles and the snakes and mammologists who come in and they will safely catch various rodents, usually rodents, uh, such as cotton rats, and measure those. You can see really, really tiny. This cotton rat's got a little ear, almost like an earring too, um, to, to mark them for research. We also have researchers, undergrad and graduate researchers from our local universities who will come in and do a variety of research. For example, we have a group of students coming in and studying insects and uh, which plants they use. So they're, they're looking at both the plants in our arboretum and which insects are there. And we promote a lot of citizen science. If you're not familiar with that term, citizen science means people just like us who are not necessarily researchers contributing to science, making observations in your yard, your neighborhood, your park, just your local area. And there's a whole wide variety of citizen science projects that you can contribute to. So we do a lot of citizen science at Prairie Ridge where we're encouraging our students, our visitors to help us make those observations. We teach them the skills and then we hope that they make some of those observations in their own neighborhood. The importance of citizen science is because researchers can't be in every place all the time. And some of the trends that we see in animals are seen over wide variety or wide areas. So if we're able to explain what's happening, what we notice in our neighborhoods, and we're able to report it, that can help scientists to see the bigger picture, even though they can't go to all the neighborhoods on their own. So these photos here show, we do a lot of monarch uh, citizen science, monarch butterfly citizen science. So we do monarch larva monitoring project where we're actually looking under the leaves of milkweeds and we're reporting if we see an egg, if we see the caterpillars, how old those caterpillars are, there's different stages called instars. So we're reporting what age those caterpillars are, we're reporting if we see the adult butterflies in the fall, we are actually tagging the butterflies. This is a very safe sticker that you put on precisely a very specific part of the wing that lets them fly. And it also, much like the bird band, it also has a code on it. So if that butterfly is seen somewhere else or even photographed, if you see a butterfly with a sticker on it, if you can photograph it and see that, you can see where that uh, butterfly was caught and stickered and you can report back uh, where uh, where you saw that butterfly. And of course they migrate all the way down to South America, which is just amazing. So we're part of that research to help track where the butterflies are. And the last picture is a volunteer helping us with our nest watch. We have a number of bird boxes all around the property. And so we'll go and check those every um, few days, see if there are nests, see if there are eggs, record when they hatch, when they fledge, all of that, and what species they are. Um, and that goes back to a lot of different types of research as well. One of the cool things we do is we set up camera traps, which is just a motion sensor trap, because some animals are not always present when we are walking around. In fact, they are specifically hiding from us. So our camera traps primarily will capture mammals. Um, so we know we have coyotes, fox, raccoon, deer, uh, groundhog, all these types of things. Unfortunately, we occasionally see feral cats there too. 
um, but they are all contributing and uh, and um, impacting the ecosystem as well. One cool thing that we saw in 2014 that ended up on the trail cam was a bobcat. And if you look really closely at this photo, you can obviously see this is a deer. And then right over here, there is a bobcat. Um, and keeping in mind, where are we? We're in West Raleigh. So it's really cool to, to know that there was a bobcat there. Our property is also really close to Shank Forest and Umstead. Um, so hopefully they were using it as the bigger corridor for wildlife. I don't think that bobcat's been seen on the property since then, um, but that's pretty exciting. Now we have been closed since March um, to the public. We've gone there to tend to the fields and keep track, you know, keep the land going. But we also put up some camera traps because one thing we noticed is we were seeing turkeys in the middle of the day. And I wanna share with you my favorite camera trap photo of these turkeys. We had it down low and this turkey was wondering what that was. <laughs> so we have two turkeys that are frequenting in the middle of the day. I have never seen turkeys just hang out in the middle of the day. They trust us, obviously. Um, but I suspect that this wouldn't happen if we were open to the public every day. Um, but that's by far my favorite photo of our turkeys on our camera traps this year so far. Um, it's hilarious. I, I think I need to save it as my desktop. Um, and of course we have been closed. And so we are missing our audiences. We're, we're so missing our families, our students, um, but education and science must go on. So we were able, along with the many other uh, staff down at the museum downtown, able to quickly pivot and go virtual. Um, and we have done this in a variety of ways. One big thing we've done is promote citizen science. Because as I mentioned, this is science that you would do in your own yard, in your own neighborhood. And so we at Prairie Ridge focused heavily on citizen science that you can do while you're in quarantine, in your backyard, in your neighborhood park, safely and social distanced. So my coworker, Chris Goforth, and she's pictured here, She's been doing a lot of videos about citizen science and exactly how those methods, what you do, how you can report it. Um, she's been making these videos in her backyard because you'd be doing citizen science in your backyard too. Um, we also work closely with downtown and also our branch down in Whiteville. So this is Meredith Morgan down in Whiteville talking about hummingbirds and how to feed the hummingbirds, how to make your own hummingbird water and some science about that. Um, of course, we're focusing on citizen science. Um, so we also have um, an eco explorer program that is being launched in uh, right about now, um, which really emphasizes how children grades K through eight can get involved in citizen science by taking photos and making observations. And of course, like I said, we do research um, and some of our research projects are actually open to the public to observe. And normally we are banding, um, these are purple martins, purple martin birds. Um, and normally when we banned the babies, um, we, usually it's open to the public. And of course we couldn't do that this year. So this year, uh, John Gerwin was filmed doing this and we also put that online so you could still see the research happening. We've also done posts as far as uh, encouraging you to get your children outside, even if it's not doing science. Nature is very, very important, especially we're cooped up a lot. So hopefully you've been able to take advantage of going outside. So we've been giving tips and tricks on how you can take your children outside and do something fun. Um, and also we are focusing on identifying wildlife that you might actually see in your own neighborhood. Um, all of these are primarily on our Prairie Ridge Facebook page. Some of them are also reposted to the, the May Museum's Facebook page, social media, and website. <coughs> um, so there's plenty of places that you can find these resources, not only the upcoming ones, but also the ones that have already been posted. You can go back in the archives and find all these resources and still do some of the citizen science that we've featured along the way. Um, so some quick links, um, we are part of the Museum of Natural Sciences, therefore our website is part of the Museum of Natural Sciences website slash prey-ridge. If you don't remember that, you can go to the Museum of Natural Sciences website, hover over visit, and you'll see Prairie Ridge pop up there. And there's a wealth of information there. For example, like I said, our nature neighborhood garden, if you're interested in seeing our species 
of plants. If you're interested in putting in your own neighborhood garden, a pollinator garden, you can go look at, the, at that. If you're interested in seeing what species we've had, I mentioned we have a wide bio biodiversity. Our animal species list is also at that link, um, so you can see our biodiversity. Unfortunately, we don't have a plant list outside of the garden, um, but we do have our animal list there if you're interested in seeing what kind of animals that we see, because my photos did not cover it. Um, and of course, the museum, Prairie Ridge, and Whiteville, we've all been doing virtual learning, and a lot of Prairie Ridge's programs are also at our Science at Home page, which is there on the main page of the museum. So you can see a lot of other resources there. Follow us on Facebook. Take a child outside for more, more ideas on how to take your children outside. And if you have any questions after this, I think hopefully Chris has some questions that you've been sending us. But if you have questions or want to contact me after this, there's my email there. And a mushroom, because I didn't talk about mushrooms. Bonnie, thank you very much. Excellent stuff. So we did uh, we did get some questions that came in, and I'll remind everybody that you can post more of your comments and questions in the chat box, and let us know if you're watching, if you've actually visited Prairie Ridge Eco Station, uh, participated in any of the programs out there, uh, you know, or gone and seen what's going on. It's a really cool space. But I was thinking as you were going, Bonnie, how common is it for a natural history museum or institution like ours to have a place like that? It is not common. I don't know how many other museums have. I, some of them do. I know of some of them. I don't know how many, but it is definitely not very common to have an outdoor research facility or a backyard, you know, mm -hmm. um, to do this type of nature education. I, I don't know how many there are, but I mean, it seems like such a great resource. I mean, for all the, the reasons that you mentioned, but um, I, was, I was also curious about the, all of the different things that happen at Prairie Ridge, right? So there's research that's going on and we can do research there because we've preserved habitat. So there's the nature preserve part, but then there's also the part that we don't mind if kids just destroy. <laughs> so making making space for both of those things. And I, I guess I'm curious about the, the decision-making or the thought process that goes into dedicating, you know, what's really not like a huge space to, to so many different activities. I mean, spending time in nature is so important. It's part of developmental learning for younger kids. When you're playing in nature, you're using your imagination and to be able to take sticks and mud and make something with that to have no rules, to not have a, a list of rules of this is how you play with this. Like a, a lot of our toys or games or a, a lot of our technology has very specific, this is how you do it. Um, to have a space where you have sticks, mud, rocks, you know, seeds, and to be able to create with that is really important in development, uh, young early childhood development. Um, risks, you know, playing outside, playing anywhere has risks but that also helps in the development of decision-making, um, running around using the outdoors as, as your playground. Uh, it really helps in development. Um, so it's really important. We also really enjoy using nature as our classroom. We have thousands of students, um, primarily elementary school students who come out and use our lands as field trips. So we're teaching science, curriculum correlated science, using the outdoors. So really emphasizing the things they're already learning in school, metamorphosis, ecosystems, adaptations, except they're seeing it in real life, not in a textbook, um, which is really valuable too, because it makes it real. Sometimes we read things in a textbook or see photos or even see it online and we're like, well, is that really real? Well, when you get to go outside and see it yourself, you see that really is real. That really is our immediate uh, surroundings, and we are part of that, um, which is another huge benefit of having Prairie Ridge as a classroom. What have been some of the more, um, I guess, creative or innovative uses that, that you've come up with or, or that other educators and naturalists at Prairie Ridge have, have come up with? Oh, geez, I don't know. I, um, in, in the play space, 
um, you know, we have a lot of old pots and pans and stuff, but we also will gather just a bowl of sweet gumballs. And I don't know that how innovative that is, but mm -hmm. it's simple, right? If you gather sweet gumballs or um, logs or sticks, or sometimes we'll just go pull a bunch, you know, of, of flowers and put them out there and just see what the kids do. Um, that, that's been really, really cool. We are also do some uh, workshops out there uh, for adults using the land um, to really kind of emphasize, you know, especially educators to really encourage you to go outside, take your children outside and use the land, use your, use your schoolyard, you know, as part of an extension of your education. So I'm going to go to the chat and see uh, what thoughts and questions are coming in there. Uh, let's see, the first one on the list uh, is Prairie Ridge open to the public to visit? Well, it would be. It would be. Um, we normally are open. Um, currently, we're closed while the museum's closed, um, but we will definitely be updating on our website and our social media when we are able to open. Now, here's one that came in from Twitter, actually. Uh, Prairie Ridge is uniquely located near urban Raleigh and near the National Guard and Emergency Operations Centers. What's it like managing this area for wildlife and cooperating with those agencies? It can be very interesting. We're very lucky that we're so close to Shank Forest. We actually have a partnership with the forest manager there um, and close to Umstead. Um, so we're really part of a wide wildlife corridor, which is really, really cool um, because we don't have a lot of forested land on our property, but we know that animals are going back and forth. Um, it is fun being by the National Guard. Uh, they have a helipad, a helicopter pad. Um, so sometimes we're teaching and that helicopter comes and we just stop teaching and we all look at the helicopter because sometimes the helicopter is a little bit cooler than whatever bird I'm talking about, right? <laughs> um, you can't help it. Kids love helicopters. So that's, that's really fun. Um, we also see a lot of action when we have an, a state of emergency, for example, a hurricane. Um, that is where the headquarters are. That's where we see FEMA set up. Um, we see National Guard coming in and out, um, but we have a great partnership with them as well. Um, they wander over. Some of them will come and walk our land on their lunch break. Um, so it is, it is very interesting. We're kind of hidden though, because a lot of times people will just wander over and go, well, what is this? Um, so that's really fun. We love sharing that with our neighbors too. Lisa wants to know, what are some of your favorite plants in the native garden? So I personally really love coneflower. I think they're really pretty. They come in all these colors, but the plant that has surprised me is mountain mint. And this plant, um, it's not a very showy flower. They're green um, and they kind of look like really tall weeds but the, the pollinators love it. Um, I was out there the other day pulling weeds and there were just, I, I looked up and I realized I was crouching down right by it and I looked over and I realized there were literally hundreds of bees and wasps and other pollinators on this mountain mint, all minding their own business, you know, collecting nectar. Um, but because of, obviously the pollinators love it. Uh, that's, I, that's been my surprise favorite plant in there. <laughs> Nice. That's uh, coneflowers are also one of my favorites. Yes. But but you're right. I have some mountain mint planted out here in the in the front yard, fortunately too. And yeah, the pollinators just. I mean, they love all of that stuff. But the little bitty tiny nondescript flowers, ones that they really go for. Yeah. But that's so great, right? Again, like that. There's a resource for someone maybe like me, like I like to plant native plants. I want a pollinator garden in my yard. I can go to Prairie Ridge and say, okay, what's planted here? What's growing well? How much does it spread? <laughs> How much space is it taking up? Right. And, you know, just take notes and get to be outdoors at the same time. Absolutely. And the benefit to natives is they're used to growing in this climate. So once you get them established more or less, unless we're in a drought, they take care of themselves, which I personally like. I've planted a lot of the same species in my own yard and uh, I don't have a green thumb. So I appreciate that once I get them established, they do their own thing. And it's so great for the pollinators to have their local, their native plants. All right, here's another question from the chat. Does Prairie Ridge worry about invasives 
And if so, how do you control them? That's an excellent question. Yeah, there's there's no way to be completely rid of all invasives. Unfortunately, they're called invasives for a reason. They don't they don't pay attention to boundaries. So yes, we are constantly battling invasives. So some of the invasives that we have include um, the privet. Um, we have a lot of blackberry in our fields, which a lot of it's native, but we're trying to keep the prairie, so therefore it's considered native. We have microstegium, that's Japanese stilt grass. Um, we have a lot of those, and we have some. Um, invasive insects as well. Primarily, we are focused on the plants trying to eradicate those. So we do it in the safest way possible. We physically cut, we physically pull, dig up by the roots. Um, when we use chemicals, it's very targeted, very specific, um, just because we don't want to target all those other wonderful native plants that we have out there. Um, so we do our best to, to do it with minimal impact on the rest of the species. We're very careful to do it at the right time of day, the right time of year, all that kind of stuff. We'll also have volunteer groups coming in, especially for things like privet. If you're, if you're not familiar with privet, it's kind of a small tree like a bush. Um, and so our volunteer groups will come out and help us cut down the privet and haul it away and, and all that kind of stuff. But as a staff, we're constantly working on that too. Excellent, excellent stuff. So you just mentioned it. Tell me a little bit of, uh, or tell me more, I guess, about maintaining all of these spaces. Um, you have to pull a lot of weeds. <laughs> we do. Uh, normally, we have a whole crew of wonderful, wonderful volunteers who come out and help us with those weeds, especially in the nature neighborhood garden, because we do have paths that are mulched in there. I am missing their our volunteers so much, um, not only because I miss them, but I can't do what they do. <laughs> um, I've been, you know, helping pull all those weeds. Um, our staff's been in there um, keeping the paths mulched, which also help cut down on the weeds in there pulling out the privet, you know, all that kind of stuff. So we do have, even as we've been close, we've had staff on the ground every day, just about every day, um, still keeping those paths mowed so that when we do open, they're ready to go. We haven't been completely taken over by prairie. Um, keeping track of those invasives and doing some small upgrades, getting ready to be open again. Let's see, uh, Brian is watching, Brian Wirtz. He said, down with the privet. Yeah, <laughs> we're trying. <laughs> um, tell me a little bit more. Uh, we've got a few minutes left here about some of the, the research that goes on, because you've talked about looking at, you know, the variety of birds and insects. And does most of what you know or that you've learned about what's living at Prairie Ridge come from, you know, you're walking the trails in the paths every day? Are you taking notes on what you see in addition to, you know, museum ornithologists and entomologists coming out and doing the whole surveys of the place? It's a, it's a combination of staff observations, citizen science observations, and a lot of that is observations even by our volunteers. We'll take on specific projects that they do weekly and our research researchers. So it's kind of a, a group effort. I don't always see all the results of the research, the actual research that happens. But if something is changed or different um, or unique, they usually tell us. Sometimes I find out that there's a cool migrate, migratory bird because somebody's observed it, told the birders, and all of a sudden um, people start uh, coming in with binoculars and that's how I find out. Um, so it's a, whole, it's a whole mix of stuff. Sometimes the researchers will email us and say, hey, we noticed this or, um, or it's just the staff. A lot of it is from observation, from citizen science, um, those types of observations, because especially our citizen science is done usually on a more weekly basis, and we're comparing it year after year, whereas some of the research is maybe happening a couple times a year, depending on uh, the different seasons. But I know our bird banders are typically there about every other week, a couple times a month, and some of the one of the reports they put out recently um, or at least they told us, is that they've actually learned that there's a cardinal um, that is over 10 years old and has been caught repeatedly at Prairie Ridge, um, which is that 10 years old seems really old for a cardinal, <laughs> um, especially a, a, you know, a wild animal in general. So stuff like that is, is, is happening all the time out there, which is really, really cool. What's your favorite time of year? 
to be out at Prairie Ridge. Like, like if I'm going to, if I'm somebody, I'm like, all right, I'm going to come visit uh, once everything's back open. Is there like a particular season that I should think, you know what, I'm going to get the best view of the pond or the wildlife. So I am split. I have two favorites. Um, I really enjoy spring um, because I really enjoy watching the leaves emerge, the buds open up things just starting to come alive again. But if you really want a wildlife watch, you really want to see those butterflies um, and, and everything. And a lot of times people are coming to see, they're expecting to see the butterflies. Fall, September is really a great time because the butterflies are active, the caterpillars are out, all the birds are still active. Birds are active year round anyway, but um, I think fall is really the best time. End of spring, and then it gets really hot. There's a lot of stuff out there, but sometimes they're hiding in the middle of the day. And then fall is really, really when everything comes out. Okay, uh, Cindy wants you to tell us about the American bittern that used to come back every year. Oh, I actually don't know. I have photos of it, but I wasn't working out there when it came back. So Cindy might have to tell me. <laughs> but we, <laughs> but we, did, we did have one. I do have photos of it. That'll be the next staff meeting. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll all learn about the American bittern. Okay, there's another question here too. What is a good native plant to encourage dragonflies? Oh, so dragonflies are carnivores. And so they eat a lot of mosquitoes, which is really, really great. Um, so really, if you have a habitat for a lot of smaller insects, then you have habitat for dragonflies. And of course, water, they lay their eggs in water. Um, so some type of water source, like our pond, for example. Um, but dragonflies really don't hang around the pond uh, all the time because uh, they can get eaten too by other things that are hanging on, around the pond, like frogs and birds. Um, so just some place for them to hide during the day, a water source for them to lay eggs. And then if you have little insects, you probably have enough food sources for dragonflies. And I'm going to go on a limb and say that most of us have mosquitoes around <laughs> and other smaller insects. So. So yeah, it's more habitat, variety habitat than it is specific plants for dragonflies. Okay, which is something good that, that goes on at Prairie Ridge. There's there's yeah. a tremendous variety of habitats. Uh, and, and if you don't have dragonflies where you are, you can come see the ones at Prairie Ridge. Yeah, exactly. I see them in my yard and I don't have a water feature anywhere in my neighborhood. So they're traveling, there's a creek multiple yards down the way from my house and I still see dragonflies. So if you want to see a lot of them, uh, you know, more water features, I guess. So what programs do you have coming up virtually uh, that people should be on the lookout for? Yeah, so most of our programs go up on our Facebook page first. Um, and because I will be honest, because we weren't doing virtual programs until March, not very often, we've had our Facebook page, but we weren't really focused on doing actual programming there. Um, we don't have them planned out too far in advance. I can tell you stuff that we are brainstorming now. Um, it's not yet on the Facebook page, um, but for the next month, uh, we are definitely continuing our citizen science series, our posts about how to get involved. Um, and in September, uh, the museum will doing, be doing Bug Fest and we will be doing taking part in that. This past weekend, we just did a virtual moth night where we went live from various staff members' houses and we looked at moths um, and we helped people identify the moths um, in their own yards and the ones that we were seeing. So we're hoping to do something similar. Um, and we're also looking at uh, it, putting together a citizen science challenge for arthropods for bug fest. So more on that later, but definitely uh, follow us on Facebook uh, at Prairie Ridge or at the museum. The museum's main site also shares a lot of our events as we put them up um, and you'll be able to get notifications as we get to where we put them online. Unfortunately, we don't put them online too far in advance because we're, we're doing it as we go. <laughs> I think a lot of people are doing that. Yeah, I think so too. All right. Uh, so. I'll remind everybody, uh, yeah, follow Perry Ridge on Facebook. Great resource, especially right now. All kinds of great activities that you can get involved in. You'll get notified about when they're going to be doing live events from the Prairie. Uh, and you can see some of Chris Goforth's great videos too. 
Of course, you can follow the Museum of Natural Sciences, the main pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're at Natural Sciences, and you can visit naturalsciences.org to get more information about museum programming and Prairie Ridge Eco Station programming. It'll all be there on the virtual events calendar, which you can access from the Science at Home page, and I think from naturalsciences.org, the homepage itself. So uh, with that said, Bonnie, thanks so much. Everybody in the chat loves you. They say that you're wonderful and engaging. Oh, I love everybody in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, there was a question about sharing your slides, but uh, everybody, you can come back to this same link for the YouTube video and the video will be archived here. So everything that you saw and heard will be here for as long as the museum and YouTube are around at least. So it's there as a resource for you to come back and take advantage of. Bonnie, one more time, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, thank you. And whenever we do open, when the museum in Prairie Ridge opens, we hope that you will visit both. All right, everybody. That's our show. Thanks for watching, and I hope we'll see you again real soon. We'll be back here next Wednesday at noon for another Lunchtime Discovery Series. Oh, and you can sign up for the Lunchtime Discovery Series newsletter at the website for the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education. Follow them on Twitter as well at North Carolina EE, and you can get updates about what presentations are coming up each Wednesday at noon. There, I think I said it all. Bye, everybody.